Imagine having an empire absolutely bursting with memories, all of which are at your disposal. And maybe in your empire there are cities, and in those cities are libraries for literature, laboratories for the sciences, theaters for languages, and sports complexes for the physical skills and the anatomy that you want to remember about your body. And that's just scratching the surface of all the power having multiple memory palaces will bring to your practice. And there might even be an easier and more direct way to approach the idea of multiple memory palaces that is much more fun and faster than having to pause and think about what goes where, not to mention eliminating the Sherlock Holmes hassle of, I must go to my mind palace. No, 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 no. We don't want to spend time like that. This isn't TV world. And truly, who in this real world has time to pause and think about their memory palaces? Well, welcome memory enthusiasts, because today we're taking your memory palace practice to the next level. And I don't mean next level in any vague or cliche way. Each new memory palace you add to your memory palace networks literally exercises more of your memory and your mind and makes it possible to retain more information than you ever thought possible. But before we dive in, we're gonna quickly recap the basics of what memory palaces are. I know that this will be review for some of you, but let's always remember the power of holding onto and nurturing beginner's mind. Although we use memory palaces to reduce the amount of times that we have to repeat information in order to learn it well, Repetition is indeed the mother of learning, and it promotes understanding. And not one amongst us knows what we do not know, which is why, in addition to maintaining beginner's mind the truth of memory masters and how to master any skill in any area of performance, is to revisit the fundamentals over and over and over again. Mastery truly is about ongoing study and practice. And that is as true of the Memory Palace technique as it is of anything else. Okay, the Memory Palace technique, which goes by many names that we don't have to rehearse now, is a powerful mnemonic device. It works by associating information you want to remember with specific locations that are strung along a familiar place, a highly optimized journey, or at least I hope you optimize your journeys. For example, you might use your childhood home, placing items you need to recall in different rooms, but not willy-nilly. You've thought about the order of those rooms so that later when you want to recall the information that you've placed in your memory palace, you're able to do so in a very seamless way. So imagine, if you're new to this, that you've filled every nook and cranny of that home that you've chosen with memories. Where do you go next if you've done with this memory palace? How do you avoid slowing down by having to think for more than a few seconds when you're ready to move from one memory palace to the next? Well, that's where the advanced considerations we'll be discussing today come in, and they come in in a big way. And there's a bit of a surprise coming for you too, because in this video, we're going to explore how to use multiple locations exponentially, not only to exponentially increase what you can memorize and your memory capacity, but also how you can exponentially increase the number of memory palaces that you have. So we're gonna talk about selecting and linking diverse locations to enable maximum retention. We're gonna talk about organizing vast amounts of information across multiple memory palaces and navigating seamlessly between the spaces you've assigned for a variety of topics. And by the end of today's tutorial, you'll have the tools to build not just one memory palace, but an entire memory universe, starting, of course, with countries and provinces or states, and then cities and neighborhoods, and then individual places inside of your memory palaces. So whether you're a student tackling complex subjects, a professional managing intricate projects, or someone simply looking to sharpen your mind, this technique will revolutionize the way you remember. And yes, I have to introduce the video three or four times to communicate the extraordinary value of what you're about to receive. So if you're ready to unlock the full potential of your mind, smash, and I mean seriously, smash that thumbs up so the robots never forget that we humans care about human memory. Get subscribed if you're new here 
And let's get multiplying by beginning your journey through the advanced world of multiple memory palaces with a constant eye on the truth about what mastery truly is, ongoing study of the great memory tradition, implementation of the core strategies that you discover along the way, and dedicated practice day after day after day, because that's what it's all about. This is Dr. Anthony Metivier from MagneticMemoryMethod.com. And now that we've set the stage, let's dive into why using multiple locations is going to be a game changer for your memory practice. And we got to first address the limitations of having just one memory palace, which is what a lot of people do. And that's okay. It's cool. No problemo. But you're going to have capacity constraints. Even the most elaborate single location, like a mansion or a sprawling university campus, eventually runs out of distinct spaces. Now, I've used university campuses like York University, where I got my PhD, University of Saarland in Germany, where I had a Mercator grant and taught for a number of years, University of Toronto, Rutgers I've used, I taught there for a while. And I don't really think of them as one memory palace, but a lot of people might do that, and that's problematic, and there's ways to divide them that we'll talk about later. But you're gonna have constraints if you think in just terms of one memory palace. You're also gonna constrain your own abilities with the skill because your spatial memory will never get exercised outside of that one memory palace. So you definitely want multiple memory palaces to transcend, my friend, because there are multiple levels of spatial memory that you can explore that connect with things like figural memory and then tap into more autobiographical memory and blah, blah, blah. Like there's a lot of science words that we can talk about, but at the end of the day, you can transcend constraints. And that's really, really beautiful. It'll make you more flexible. Information overload is another problem that people have with just one memory palace or a limited number of memory palaces. You wind up cramming too much information into one place. This leads to confusion. It leads to cross-contamination of memories. Sometimes people call this problem ghosting or the ugly sister effect. And the ugly sister effect is a thing. It's a term in the book Nemonology, if I remember correctly. And the scientists who wrote that book used it to describe how when Prince Charming went looking for Cinderella, the sisters that he wasn't looking for kept coming to the door, not Cinderella. So the idea here is that when you overload a memory palace or you reuse one memory palace over and over and over again, you wind up getting the information that may be technically correct, but it relates to something else than what you wanted to remember. And frankly, this issue has a very simple solution, which we're talking about today, multiple memory palaces. But when you choose to bumble and stumble over one memory palace, go ahead and just acknowledge that that's what you're choosing to do. And, you know, if you get into problems with one memory palace, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, sometimes I'm talking and I get the wrong information out of my mouth, or sometimes no information will come at all. This happened recently where this one beautiful Sanskrit phrase that I've memorized inside and out, Turtva, Moharnavam, Hatva, Ragadvesh Jirakshashan, yeah, that's right, Yoga, Shantasanta, Yuktatma, Ramo, Varajate. It just wasn't coming to my mouth. It wasn't even coming to my mouth correctly <laughs> right now. That just happens, right? This is not a multiple memory palace issue, but even with multiple memory palace issues, if you have these issues with your mouth, just come back to it. Start again. You know, it's, uh, it, we, we're looking at better memory, not perfect memory. And that's another problem that a lot of people have. And if you have one memory palace, you're probably going to get stuck in perfectionism. This memory palace has to be perfect. I want to save my one memory palace for the best possible information when I'm ready someday. Well, someday never comes. And that's another problem with not having multiple memory palaces. When you have multiple memory palaces, you're just like, damn, I want to memorize this thing. Boom. You've got a memory palace instantly because you have more than enough. And this is a contextual thing as well, because some information makes more sense in specific environments, which a single location can't provide. I mean, you can't have this vast amount of contextual reference points. So simple example, when I wanted to memorize the Upadesa Sharam, I was just like, well, I have I have spent a long time since I was in a particular location with Uwe Boll. His name starts with U. I could use that for the Upadesa Sharam. But the first word of the Upadesa Sharam starts with cart. It's called Turagnia Praputefalum. So, okay, Kelvin Grove. Boom. KK. So the context really helps to shift on the fly so you're not spending more than a second thinking about where you're going to stick something you want to memorize. And then you can also 
wind up with retrieval difficulties if you have one or very limited amounts of memory palaces because you have relegated everything to this single space and that makes it harder to use recall rehearsal which is ultimately the best way to use memory palaces to help you quickly and reliably absorb massive amounts of information and get it into long-term memory so that it's just there without doing the Sherlock Holmes things. I must go to my mind palace. No, 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 no. That's not what we want to do. So this is really where multiple locations shine. Virtually unlimited storage by expanding to multiple locations. You're really only limited by your imagination. You can invent memory palaces. Now there are problems with doing that and I talk about that in depth in my virtual memory palace video and you can check that out if you want. But once you've addressed those problems, there truly is no such thing as running out of space. Now, sometimes people wonder about, you know, is the memory like a sponge? Will I have to squeeze things out? And the answer is no, that, that really just doesn't make any sense. Think about your vacation sponge. Are you ever going to not have space in your life for one more hotel that you book and go on a vacation in? You may have other limitations like time and money and all that sort of stuff, right? But at the end of the day, it is possible that if you had those resources, you could go to hotel, 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 and it would never be that your life somehow has so many visits to so many hotels that you would have to squeeze out some of the other ones. No, this is the miracle of memory. It is expansive endlessly. The brain has so much information, apparently the computer that would even begin to scratch the surface of how much activity is going on in the brain would need to have a zettabyte. You know, that's all the information in the world for capturing the information that is being processed or the activity in just one brain. So I've read. Anyway, beyond this, having multiple memory palaces doesn't have to be trillions or billions or millions or even thousands of them. Just having a couple dozen is already going to set you on the path of improved mental organization. So you can dedicate different locations to various subjects or various types of information and create a, shall we say, natural categorization system. I'll talk a little bit more about that. It's not really natural, but in my practice, it is very natural to pay attention to the relationships that alphabetization creates. And so this is a slightly more direct level, but we're going to talk about many, many options. And I just mentioned one of the ways that alphabetical options work. Upadesa Sharam, well, it starts Cartaragnia and it's just like, bam, Kelvin Grove. So because of thinking alphabetically, the correspondence between the K and the first line of Kelvin Grove is a natural link. And it is natural for humans to use the tools that operate in the world that we are born into this world where things are named alphabetically and pieces of poetry start with words that are alphabetically enunciated through the mouth, cart. So Kelvin cart, away we go, right? Whether things are natural or unnatural is an old debate in <laughs> artificial memory discussions. Let's skip that for now. Really what I want you to have is enhanced context. So you don't have to use the alphabetical principle and I don't use it all the time myself. Ultimately though, the more memory palaces you have, the more you'll be able to select and use locations that do align with your content. Like if you're memorizing history, you could use historical sites. If you're learning biology, you could use a nature reserve or a zoo could be perfect. You pick it, having a wide range of memory palace options will help you stick it. And then you get increased engagement sometimes. So if you have a diversity of locations, it keeps the memory process fresh and interesting, helping maintain your motivation. And you become adaptable in your mind. You have mental dexterity. So you encounter new information or you need to reorganize something in your mind or use the principle of compounding. You can easily modify locations without disrupting your entire system or getting you know, all tripped over yourself because you're just used to using multiple locations. So if you have a bunch of words that start with A and you fill Adam's house to the brim and you don't want it to lie fallow for a long time until you can use Adam's memory palace again, you can go to Applebee's or an Apple store and you'll already have it ready to go because you've set them up in advance, which is what I teach as part of the Magnetic Mary Method, where preparation meets opportunity, there is no ceiling. There are so many cool ways that you can imagine shifting from one memory palace to another, and we'll talk about that later too, 
But keep in mind as we get there that you always want to optimize for recall rehearsal. Very, very important. Now, of course, another benefit here is you're going to have linked locations that create additional neural connections in your mind for what is sometimes called arse combinatoria, the art of combination. Now, you might be thinking, yeah, right, buddy, you're going to have increased neuronal connections. Oh, yes, indeed, you will. I mean, at least that's what the memory science shows us. So I don't want to get into a long lecture about the turgor pressure in the dendritic spines of your neurons and the nodes of Renvier. But all that stuff is real. And the positive and negative ion pressure and all this stuff has to do with the speed of how information can flow between the synaptic gaps there and so forth. I'm not a neuroscientist. I haven't memorized everything under the sun about neurons and so forth, but there are all kinds of cool things about th this this area. And the nose of Ranvier, I think that is a, a term, and the dendritic spines and so forth. So I've memorized some of it, and it is just absolutely incredible to learn a little bit more about that. And it will create more neuronal connections in your mind. It will make the dendritic spines tougher. And that means you're going to remember more. So in a way, what we're doing when we're using multiple memory palaces is we're actually making our neuronal connections stronger. Neuroplasticity is real. When you do the exercises as I teach them in a variety of videos and programs I've created, you're actually using spatial memory in a way that strengthens those connections. You're using autobiographical memories from your own life that are related to those locations exercising your mind and setting the stage for more accomplishments yet to come. And here's the thing. Lots of people say to me, I don't understand this. Don't worry about understanding. Just start doing. It's one of the few times in this world that I will ever say to you, don't think too much about this. Just start doing. Take action, take action, take action. I'm a critical thinker. And you know, by all means, do critical thinking. Look at all the research. I have such a beautiful job because memory is pretty much the perfect science. There are thousands of years of tradition. There are documents from the ancient world that teach this technique, and they're reproducible today. There are memory competitors year after year after year smashing records based on what is written in those documents. So the people who are like, well, my brain ticks differently. Eh, no, probably not. And if something is stopping you, it's not the techniques. The techniques do not have any issues with you. It's probably something in your procedural memory or it's in your implicit memory where you have limited beliefs or you have self-doubt or maybe you have a bad diet or whatever's going on. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a psychotherapist. I'm not a... a a health and fitness <laughs> guru or anything like that. But at the end of the day, the techniques aren't the problem. The lack of evidence isn't the problem because we have more science than any of us has time to read that work in the favor of these techniques being worth your time, your energy, and your focus and your concentration. And we're going to explore more about how to choose the right locations for your expanded memory palace network, etc. But this kind of idea, well, I just don't understand enough yet to get started. Understanding's never coming. It just isn't because I don't even understand why this room that I'm sitting in exists. I don't understand why I exist. I don't understand why a thing called memory exists. It's actually secondary. Beautiful to explore. You can become a memory scientist yourself, but just get ready for an exercise that will help you blueprint your own memory metropolis and just take action without overthinking it. And I suggest right now you get something to write with so you can take notes and complete a simple exercise because it's going to be revolutionary for you. Just don't overthink it. Please, please, please. Pen, paper, colored pens if you prefer. It doesn't really matter. It's action, action, action starting right now. Now that we understand pretty much everything there is to say on the topic of why multiple locations are so powerful, let's focus on how to choose the right locations for your expanded memory palace network. The key is to select locations that are vivid, distinct, and meaningful to you, at least in the beginning. Later you can work with more vague locations, but try to make sure that you're starting in such a way that you're based on the most prominent choices because a lot of people's memories are weak. They're not used to using their imagination in this way. 
So consider this criteria, especially if you're a beginner. Familiarity matters. When you choose places that you know well, you're going to have an immediate ability to navigate it mentally, or at least a much more immediate ability. Make it distinctive if you can. So when you're building your first network, if each location is clearly different from the others, it will help you avoid confusion. So a beach is obviously very different than a city street, and a mountaintop is more distinctive than an office building. Even though, you know, office buildings do kind of look like mountains in some way in terms of being large structures that raise from the ground, you know, they're distinct from one another. But that said, if you take a moment to notice the addresses of office buildings, you can add images to them using what's called a 00 to 99 PAO system. So I'll just give you an example and you can watch my video on PAO system later if you want to learn the full deal. But on 22 Carway Street in Kelvin Grove, I have an image of Rowan Atkinson at that building and he's dressed as a nun. Well, why? Because in this system, two is an N. So if we have two Ns, we get a word like nun. At 26 Carway stands a giant statue of mathematician John Nash because now we have two which is N and six is a SH sound. So I choose John Nash. It's not a problem at all that those buildings aren't particularly distinct to me because the kinds of number systems that I teach you in the Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass make even the vaguest locations much more distinct and all you have to remember is one address number and then proceed up the addresses or down as the case may be, 22, 24, 26, etc. Now let's go a step further. It can be true that some people respond better to locations that are rich in details, but optimizing yourself so that you can use plenty of unique features isn't always the best strategy. You know, more and more I find that simple corners and walls serve as very, very effective anchor points for my memory. You know, for most of my life, I couldn't visualize at all. So I was just using the fact that, oh, I remember there was a bed there. I remember there was a bookcase over here. And I basically used a logic of what I remembered of things being where they were, right? And I always teach people to draw their memory palaces. So as you and I continue studying the art of memory together in this video, go ahead and before you start drawing anything, don't worry about whether you see these places in your mind. Don't worry too much about what you remember about them, but try to pick the ones that are nearest to you in time that are likely to be the most vivid. So start writing down using the alphabet A to Z what would be your A memory palace that's closest to you in time? For many people, it's gonna be the Apple store, right? Or you may have just visited one of your aunts. You don't have to have a friend whose name starts with A. It could be someone like an aunt, right? And the same thing with uncle. You know, you could have many, many memory palaces that way that start with U or with A, just by being a little bit uh, creative with the alphabet. But have a personal connection. Locations that hold emotional significance for you can make the memorization process even more engaging and effective. It doesn't have to be, but it can, especially when you're a beginner. So start developing your skills right now with the alphabetical association, write down the alphabet first, think about who or what location you can assign to each letter of the alphabet, and don't worry if you have to skip a few here and there. You can come back to them later. It's also not a problem if you have, as I mentioned, five options for the letter U. Just jot them down. Put aside worries about blurring things together because you're basing this on your memory. And you might go, well, what about you know, I did this once upon a time. What about the Kamloops Public Library where I studied a lot? There's actually a new library and the old one is gone, but nonetheless, I use both. And you could have K for Kamloops. You could have P for public. You could have L for library. Which one should it be? Which letter should it belong to? This is called overthinking it. <laughs> As you get better with these skills, you can use it in all these different ways thanks to the flexibility of the Magnetic Mary Method. Now, let me contradict myself a bit. I'm suggesting that you be free flowing as you go, but at the same time, kind of like chewing gum while you're walking, think about ways where you can use logical grouping. You know, K and L and P can be very strict and useful when you're not so free flowing. And consider how different locations might naturally group together or relate to specific types of information. So a lot of my first multiple memory palace networks were on campuses York University, University of Toronto. When I was working on my Biblical Hebrew, I used the buildings associated with theology studies 
and where the great Northrop Fry used to give his lectures at University of Toronto. And this gave a logical connection due to his work. So that can be something that's very, very useful. You can use sometimes the alphabetical association method with a thematic organizational method at the same time, but you don't have to force it. So force it when it's useful, or I mean, it's not really forcing it, but you know, use the logic that's there when it's useful and be more flexible when it isn't. Something you'll be able to do when you have multiple memory palaces. Also think about scalability. Choose locations that can be expanded outward if you need to, or zoomed into in greater detail if you want to. So in the Calvin Grove Memory Palace, it started in an apartment, for example, and then moved out down the elevator into the neighborhood and ultimately into different parts of Brisbane. They didn't port in some of the ways that we'll talk about later, but they just moved. And I could go right to complete one thing, left to complete another. If you're a business professional, this is something I've done a lot, you can use office for work-related information. You could use a conference center for networking contacts. You can use a library for industry knowledge and skills. And as a language learner, you know, when I've headed off to various countries, and I didn't learn the entire language, but I've bustled around the markets as soon as I got to places like Athens and used those places as where I memorized different phrases that I used in the hotel. Now you would think, why wouldn't you use the hotel for phrases you're gonna use in the hotel? I just didn't. I found it much more interesting in that particular case to use a market. Or I'd use cafes for certain conversational phrases, etc. Those travel-based memory palaces essentially count as impromptu memory palaces. I wasn't tackling Greek when I went to Athens, so I treated it in a particular way. Very, very flexible. But if I was going to learn Greek or even memorize something in Greek, like the first lines of the Iliad in Greek, which I only know in, in English translation at the moment, then you know I would say, okay, I'm tackling Greek. So I would choose a completely different strategy overall and use a standard alphabetical memory palace network. But the art of memory, is ultimately just about that, using multiple tools in multiple ways based on maximum flexibility. So the goal is not to slavishly follow this or that dude's system. It's to create a network of locations that feels right to you. You could call it natural or intuitive, but you also just want things that are strategic and who cares how artificial it is? Who cares if there's a little bit of brute force behind it? You know, this is why I call my teaching the Magnetic Memory Method. It's a method that helps you. It encourages you. It supports you in developing your own memory palace networks and your own mnemonic systems. Now, ultimately, they're never going to be your own. You know, it's coming from an alphabet that you didn't create. It's coming from thousands of years of phonemes that humans have used. So we're standing on the shoulders of not giants, just people like you and I <laughs> from back in the day, you know, and we're reading their books and we're putting it into action. So keep that in mind. This is something where you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You just have to understand the tradition. And oh boy, is it ever rich. So read as many books on memory as you can as you develop your memory systems. And heaven forbid anybody uses a real bookstore anymore. When you go and order a memory book, maybe one of mine, you can use that store where you picked it up as a memory palace and then think of the alphabetical letter that the bookstore uses to start the name of the store or even my name or the name of the book or whoever's memory book that you buy and then you start to develop this skill. You can essentially create your own future memory palaces simply by supporting your local community. Isn't that great? I think it's the greatest thing in the world. Now, in the next section, we're going to explore how to link your memory palaces together when you need to, pretty much seamlessly, creating a cohesive and magnetic memory landscape. But first, make sure you are taking a moment to jot down at least three to five locations you think would work well for your memory goals. But if you can push yourself to do it, brute force learning, Pause the video. Make sure you take action and get that alphabet done, A to Z. Yes, if you don't have Z like I happen to have had a boss named Zoltan, so I use the place where I worked for Zoltan, 
amazing movie theater in a not so amazing city. <laughs> I cleaned that place so many times you have no idea. I was a janitor once upon a day, once upon a time, once upon a day, whatever, we'll go with it. That's what it was. Night, actually, night work. Start at midnight, end at 4 a.m. Anyway, my boss's name there was Zoltan. So even though that place has a different name that doesn't start with Z, it is one of my Z memory palaces. And because I took action based on what I had, implementation led to results. Remember, implementation exercises your memory. It strengthens your memory. So if you feel like you're getting stuck in the void of inaction, always remember one of my favorite mantras, action reveals what stasis conceals. You paused and did the exercise, right? Good, I'm gonna take your magnetic word for that so we can carry on to establishing connections between the different memory palaces in your growing world of rapid remembering. Now the process of linking locations isn't all that crucial when you're using recall rehearsal correctly, but I wanna share it with you because if you do need to leap between memory palaces, it can help maintain a state of flow when you have the considerations we're gonna talk about today. So the first will be the magnetic portal method. I like to call everything magnetic. It's not just good branding, you know. It's also because magnets have two special forces. They attract what you want to remember and they repel distractions. So when you're in flow and you want to repel distractions, you could use a portal and you can create a special portal in really any location in any memory palace to port to any place. Now this will happen to you naturally if you memorize any amount of text. I call it wormholing. We'll save that for a different day. But a simple example would be imagining a distinctive door in your house memory palace that leads to your office on the other side of town. Or perhaps you have a magical, no, 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 a magnetic elevator that takes you from your office to a park right? That would be this sort of magnetic portal. Or you have a magnetic journey, which is basically the same thing looked at a different way. This is like a logical journey that connects your locations. So for example, you could leave your house, walk down a street, and even though that street technically goes to your friend's house, you could have it go to your workplace. And then instead of going into your workplace, you could wind up walking out onto a beach that you use as a memory palace. So, you know, th this can get quite complicated, but it, it is an option. And uh, personally, I would never do it that way, but you can. And it's well worth experimenting with. And the reason why I would never do it that way is because my experiments with this have fallen apart. However, the experimentation has strengthened how I use traditional memory palaces. So it's really worth every minute to spend at least a little time exploring these techniques, which is why I'm sharing them with you today. Now think about this, the magnetic map overlay. Imagine that you have locations on a giant map with very clear paths between them. This works really well if you're a visual thinker, but it can also help make you more visual and it can help you maintain spatial relationships. So once upon a time I lived in Germany and I had to pass some tests not only to prove my German language skills, but also my knowledge of Germany as a country. And I did this to remember how many Bundesländer there are in Germany. You had to know how many countries are, are bordering with Germany. You had to know the major rivers, the major state capitals or provincial capitals, Bundesländer anyway. You had to know like all this stuff. And I just used a map of Germany. Now this was assisted by the fact that I'd driven all over that country like crazy. And I've driven all over Europe. So I was able to have quite a nice picture because back then, when I lived there, believe it or not, we still had paper maps and used to stop on the side of the road and r make the map over the hood of the car and be like, where the heck are we? And so forth. So um, getting old. But in any case, that helped me be able to use this kind of map overlay method to use Germany itself as a memory palace to help me pass that test. And wow, I'm sure glad that I did because I was able to live in Germany for many years thanks to passing those tests and what an adventure. The next is the magnetic teleportation pad. So imagine you designate a specific object or place in a memory palace 
and have it always be a teleportation device that takes you to other places. This can be useful for quickly jumping between unrelated locations. And the other thing is, is you could just spontaneously throw it out. Now, as I mentioned, this is going to sort of happen to you naturally if you do any amount of work, and I call it wormholing, and sometimes I find it a little bit distracting, actually. But it happens, and you can make use of it, and you can deliberately do it. But just take care that you're not you're not mistaking activity for accomplishment because sometimes it can get easy to you know to find yourself lost in doing all kinds of wonderful and weird and wild memory activities that aren't actually spending time on memorizing stuff so be careful now one that's also very interesting to explore is the magnetic thematic bridge so you can use a common theme or object to transition between locations based on themes so if you take this bookshelf, and I have this here, there are books that are thematically related to other books. And some of these books actually have little mini memory palaces in them. It requires a 00 to 99 PAO to do that, but you can have one book leap you to a, another book through a thematic bridge. And sometimes when you're lucky, when you have magnetic serendipity, you can have the page numbers link up or dates link up to page numbers and all that sort of stuff. And this can sometimes lead to a little bit of that ugly sister effect, but usually it works pretty good, especially when you have proper recall rehearsal. Also, this can connect with school campuses. So, you know, at the end of my video on how to use virtual memory palaces, I talk about how that, you know, York University campus worked in a particular way. And also I talk about a deck of cards on the desk of a memory palace that I still have in an apartment that I used to live in, in the Feuerstrasse in Berlin in or on Auf der Strasse. Uh, in any case, there's a department there and there's a deck of cards on the desk. That desk isn't there anymore and the deck of cards isn't there anymore, but I can still go in my mind and I can remember the poem that's in that memory palace and I can go into the deck of cards, which goes to a completely different memory palace. This is really, really fun. It's limited, but it's good to exercise with. Then some people like to do this and I don't do this myself, but you can have like a Grand Central Station. And this would be literally based on Grand Central Station, perhaps, in New York. And you have all these different hallways or corridors leading to different memory palaces. Or you could imagine one long hallway with multiple doors that lead into multiple memory palaces. And you could label them using the alphabet or numbers. Ultimately, I suggest that if you're going to do that kind of thing, think about Hilbert's Hotel because Hilbert's Hotel would propose the problem of infinite expansion, and you can get lost in, in <laughs> some deep rabbit holes with that, but it's workable, and I don't, I don't know. I've never really heard anybody say, yep, I mastered a language spending time on all that, because there are alternative options. But it is good for your mind, and it will strengthen your ability to use standard memory palaces. But please, keep the following tips in mind if you're going to develop links like the ones that we just discussed. So consistency is going to be a key for a lot of people. You will maybe benefit by using the same linking method throughout your net network for easier navigation. So some people might need each portal or bridge to be different, but that requirement, it ultimately leads to so much cognitive load that you may find things fall apart. So if you're going to have these portals, Think about having them the same every time and think about rules, like every fifth station is where you're going to have a teleportation device, something like that, because then you don't have to remember it. You're just going to follow the rule of five, right? Uh, but if you sometimes have it on the fifth station, sometimes you have it on the 10th station, sometimes it's it's a green Star Trek transportation, and then sometimes it's a blue one. You're just giving yourself so much more to memorize. But that said, if you're going to go, Make the transition vivid and memorable. Make it outlandish. Make it unusual. That way you'll better remember the transitions and think about how you can also add a logical connection where that makes sense or an illogical connection that might more firmly establish the memory. However you're choosing to navigate from memory palace to memory palace, practice moving between your locations in your mind. The more you practice actually just navigating empty memory palaces, the more it's going to feel just like you move through your home. So along those lines, let's do a quick exercise. 
please make sure that you're safe to close your eyes. But by now you have a couple of locations and take a moment to visualize or feel. Kinesthetic visualization is a thing. You don't have to see it in your mind. But just whatever way works for you, even if you're just hearing footsteps, go from one part of a memory palace to the next. And then find that transition point and see if you can feel or otherwise sense the path of how you're going to jump to the next one. So if you have an A memory palace, let's say it's the Apple store, go to Brad's house or whatever you have for B and just find that place where you can navigate the mental map and portal over to the next place in your network. This is going to take some practice, but it's the foundation of using multiple memory palaces effectively. Now, some things can happen when you're doing exercises like this that surprise you. Relax. In fact, get relaxed before you do it, maybe. Maybe you're already doing it and you have your eyes closed. Whoops, sorry, I didn't tell you about the get relaxed part first. <laughs> but <laughs> you can do this again. There's nothing bad that's going to happen that I'm aware of. But sometimes I have these unusual experiences. I won't get into all the weird and wonderful things that have happened to me while I've been practicing this. But it's really, really wild. And just relax. Always breathe deeply. Oh, yes, the breath, the breath, the breath. By the way, I have this book that's coming out. I'm probably going to use a breath related title. I was originally going to call it How to Be Satisfied with Dissatisfaction. But the problem is I realized that I can't deliver on that promise. So since there's so much about connecting breathing to the use of the art of memory in the book, it will have a breathing type title. And I think I've got a really good one. Anyway, stay tuned for that. I'm really, really excited about it. But breathing and memory, they go together in so many ways. So many ways that I had to write an entire book about it. Isn't that cool? I think it's the coolest thing in the world. It's just so much hard work writing these books. Poor me, the world's smallest violin, crying just for this monumental effort. But I'm doing it for you, and I hope you will enjoy. Now that we've discussed the principle of linking our locations in a variety of ways that essentially are just variations on a common theme, let's tackle one of the most crucial aspects of using multiple memory palaces, organizing your information effectively. This is the step that transforms your memory palaces from a collection of mental spaces into a powerful, coherent system, not for storing and retrieving information, but for getting it into long-term memory so you don't have to do the, oh, I must go to my mind palace stuff, right? You just have the information. So here are some strategies that you can consider for dividing information between your locations. Ultimately, at the end of the day, I use the alphabetical memory palace method. I'll say a little bit more about why that I think it's so important, but there are many, many different ways to do this. And one is just thematic organization. So if you dedicate each location to a specific theme or a subject, this can be useful. So you could have your childhood home for historical dates, right? Because it's about your history, your home, your childhood home. So there's a maybe a natural connection in your mind about that. It doesn't have to be, it's just an idea. You could use a library for literature. You could use a laboratory for scientific concepts. I think this ultimately falls apart in many, many ways, but not necessarily. And I've certainly done it to a certain degree. You can have chronological mapping. So you could arrange information chronologically across locations based on what you're doing. So you could have an ancient history in an old castle, the medieval period in a town square. You could have a modern set of facts about recent history along a street with big old skyscrapers, something like that, right? Or you can think about hierarchical structures. So you can have locations that represent levels of detail or importance. So if you have the main ideas in a central plaza, you could have the most important ideas at the top of a fountain and then ideas that are not as important in the middle of the fountain and then an idea that's, you know, just <laughs> boring <laughs> at the bottom, but you still need to know it, right? That's prioritizing according to some sort of hierarchy. You could have logical grouping. So you could have groups related to concepts in nearby locations or, you know, you have mathematics in a school, physics in a laboratory, engineering in a nearby construction site, but they're all sort of near to each other and you're thinking, okay, so what's close to me that relates to engineering? It might not be a construction site. I don't know. But um, think of proximity. That's 
partly what I did when I was at York University or at the University of Toronto campus, etc. I was studying at those times, so I had proximity. This gives you context-dependent memory of benefits, by the way, or it can theoretically. It's, it's seen in some studies. So if you are studying particular topics that you know, you know you're going to be examined on, if you have a general idea where that exam is going to take place and you use that place as the memory palace while you're sitting there taking the exam, you're probably going to have even better memory than the memory palace that's a thousand miles away. But you want to be so good at your practice that even if the memory palace is a thousand miles away, you can still use it. So like when I gave my TEDx talk, it was in Melbourne. I didn't need the memory palace to be in Melbourne in order to give that talk because the talk was in long-term memory, right? So you can make too much out of context-dependent memory. But again, if you're new to this and if you're in a rush, I personally would choose to use the place where the exam is taking place, and that's a, that, that's a very good thing to consider if you're able to do it. You can also assign categories based on the features of locations themselves. So let's say you had to study fluid dynamics. Well, why not use a water park that you remember when you were a kid? Thermodynamics, well, probably the thing that's closest to you in your life, in the average human life, is a kitchen, right? Because, <laughs> well, maybe that's going a bit too far, but you turn the oven on and you've got some thermodynamics going on. Or if you have to study optics, if you don't have access to a, you know, an optometrist office or you don't remember an optometrist office, you could use a photography studio. That's just creative thinking, right? If you know a photography studio. Those are ideas, right? But the magnetic memory method it focuses on stripping everything down to alphabetical associations wherever possible. This is because I wanted the most direct techniques. And I observed in my research by studying historical mnemonic teachings, not starting with, but very early in my journey, Aristotle in De Memoria, figures like Giordano Bruno, they're constantly talking about the alphabet. But no matter which approach you choose, you'll benefit by considering all these factors that we just discussed and decide what goes where in a way that you're willing to experiment and let go of the outcome. Because you can always come back later to the more refined and direct magnetic memory method. Also consider the volume of information. Larger subjects are gonna need more expansive locations. My current Atma Bodha memory project is probably the largest single memory palace I've ever used. And because of the way that I've put it together, I didn't do it quite right, but I like to experiment and challenge myself. So it's not as, in like from a verse by verse basis, it's not as individually expandable as I would like. So sometimes I'm having to do these little portal things to catch up with little words that don't quite fit in the cells of the neighborhood that I made because it's not really an expandable neighborhood in this case. So Keep that in mind. Uh, it can slow you down, is what I'm trying to say. You can also think about, like, where can I use natural associations? So use locations that have a, an intuitive connection to the information. And we talked a little bit about this already, but it is going to be something that you'll develop over time. You'll develop an intuition for it, and then it won't really slow you down for too long because you have multiple memory palaces if you get into these little things where you have a cell for a verse and you need extra space and oh, now I've got to teleport over here and teleport over there. You'll, you'll at least be able to do it very, very quickly. And always choose locations that allow for some kind of future expansion of the topic. Because if you don't, then you wind up having to compress things into little areas or portal all over the place. But if you need to portal, you'll be able to, thanks to what we're talking about today. So let's look at a practical example that I think will help you get this if you haven't heard what I said before about don't always sit around trying to understand it. Take action. If you haven't taken the action that I recommended already, stop and go back to the alphabet exercise. You'll be glad that you did. So assuming that you've done that, let's imagine that you're studying for a comprehensive exam covering history, right? And you might have to do some other topics as well. So you've got your history, right? And you use a museum. And the museum has different wings for different eras of time. And then you've got maybe a literature component. So you've got a vast library that has sections for genres. And also those genres can be organized in your mind according to the historical periods 
then you have science. So maybe you use the buildings on a campus for each scientific discipline, one for chemistry, one for biology, one for physics. And within each location, you further organize information using the basic memory palace technique that we have been talking about all along. The key, if you're going to do this, is to try to find something that is going to be remembered. Because when you do these organization things, you're going to wind up giving yourself something to remember, right? Everybody's mind works differently, though. So don't be afraid to experiment. Find what works best for your thinking style. You might not have the issues that I have. I created the Magnetic Mary Method because I found all that we're talking about today. Well, not all of it, but most of it. Way too much thinking. It adds cognitive load demands. So keep that in mind. You might not have those cognitive load demands. And you can just zip around very, very quickly. I, myself... I like to benefit from it once in a while, the, the, the pressure of trying to take on more challenges. But at the end of the day, I sometimes just regret it because there's such a much more direct way of doing things. In any case, let's carry on because I want to make sure you understand this in as much depth as possible. And we're going to walk through a practical example of using this multi-location system. But again, Take a moment to complete the exercise and consider now how you might organize a subject that you're currently learning or working with across multiple locations and get some ideas going. Take a minute to journal. What would I want to memorize that would require multiple locations, whether it's a language or a topic like history or so forth? Get your ideas in your mind moving with the magic of colored pens or just straight old pens and paper. You know, it doesn't have to be exotic. But get moving. Action, action, action. Action reveals what stasis conceals. I hope you're absolutely loving all this theory. Mmm, I love theory so much I could put mustard on it and eat it. But there's always the time to put theory into practice. And I'll give you a concrete example. I'm going to walk you through the process of memorizing not such a complex set of information, but enough that you can see the Memory Palace system at work. So for this, let's imagine that we're preparing for a comprehensive exam on world history. I had to do this once upon a time. And, you know, it's a lot of fun when you're prepared in your mind. So let's say that step one is setting up the locations. I already asked you to do the exercise. If you did, you're ready to go. You'll have an R memory palace for Roman history. Now for me, I've lived such a strange life. I actually worked for a guy whose name was Roman. So beautiful. I just use Roman's house for Roman history, right? But after that's tapped out, I'm going to want to do the Middle Ages. So I'd probably start that journey in Michelle's apartment in Berlin, where I rented a room for a couple of years. And for some of the key points of the Renaissance, I would use my friend Rick's place. And this is another R, right? So we have Roman and Renaissance. So Rick is going to help distinguish Roman from Renaissance. But because Roman, and I just have magnetic serendipity to know a guy named Roman, Roman, that's very clear. I don't need to imagine him as a Roman soldier, although I could. For the Renaissance, I'm going to add Rick in the Memory Palace as a great painter dressed in robes from that time, right? So this is going to help distinguish one from the other. And because I know Rick personally, I haven't seen him for like 35 years or more, but I remember him very, very well, I can imagine how goofy and silly he would look dressed like da Vinci. So it's going to make that association much, much clearer that that's the place where Renaissance things go. Now, step two is linking these locations. So let's say you use the portal method. Maybe you have a shimmering archway at the end of your Roman history memory palace. You step through it, and then you're looking at a massive medieval castle that, in my case, has been crammed into Michelle's apartment. And then you have the first station of the memory palace beside this castle, which helps you remember the medieval period or so forth. Then you do the journey. You memorize all the medieval stuff that you want to memorize. And then you have a, a futuristic magnetic elevator that takes you to a spot in the Renaissance era. 
And maybe in Rick's memory palace for the Renaissance era, the first thing you have there is him painting the Mona Lisa. Then the third step is to start populating the palaces with what you want to memorize. So let's just keep this simple with one fact per memory palace. And depending on how you design yours, you can have loads of facts racked and stacked within your memory palaces, provided that you know how to develop well-formed memory palaces. And at the end of this video, I'll give you a resource that will teach you how to do that. Now, I would imagine myself, Julius Caesar, on my first station in Roman's Roman memory palace, and to remember Caesar's dates, I would use my 00 to 99 PAO system to have an image for 100 and an image for 44 for his dates BCE. And 100 is Tess of the Dubervilles for me, 44 is Roar! the MGM lion. <laughs> oh, it's so fun to think of that every time. And then after finishing up with that, you know, I would maybe at the end of that memory palace, I would, we would have the end of the Roman Empire and some facts around that. I would pour it on over to Michel's medieval memory palace. And then using the same number system, I would have an image for 800, which I believe was Charlemagne's coronation. And bang presto, right? Just carry on through Michel's memory palace with medieval era stuff. Then at Rick's place, I would definitely memorize 1548 as the key moment in the Renaissance era for me, personally. The birth of the great memory master, Giordano Bruno. And then you're good to go. You put all the rest of your Renaissance stuff that you want to do. And then if you want to go to the Victorian era or Edwardian or wherever you want to go, just go there as your final portal or your next portal, your penultimate por portal, <laughs> whatever you want to think of it as in your historical memory palace network and just keep going, going, going. And navigating this system is straightforward. You simply go to the different palaces that you've assigned within your memory palaces with the signature that tells you now's the time to portal and you can move quite logically through space to reach your target information. Now, another step is what if you want to add detail? What if you have to compound in something else? Well, you can, and you just go to where in the memory palace you need to add something. So let's say you want to remember that Julius Caesar was supposedly the first to have a coin made in his name. I don't know if that's true or not, but if it is, then you can add a giant coin to his chest. And then when you do your recall rehearsal, you think of that additional fact and you'll have his dates and you'll have this fact about him on the same body, in the same place, in the memory palace. Or let's say you want to remember that some scholars think that Shakespeare may have based some of the sour aspects of Hamlet's character on Giordano Bruno. You can have Bruno himself in your Renaissance memory palace reflect this somehow. And this is where you need to start coming up with your own ways to have these facts reflect the target information or have these images reflect the facts that you want to remember. There's many ways to do this, and the best way to get the proper education on the matter is to complete the exercises, the ones I'm giving you today, but also in the Magnetic Mary Method Masterclass. Most people tell me it takes them two to five hours to set up the multiple memory palaces and all of the alphabetical images that you need. That's a short period of time to basically be founded and grounded on the path, and then you're good to go. So if they can do it, you can do it too. My testimonial wall is so long. It's unbelievable and it's getting longer and longer all the time. Hopefully you'll be adding to it soon. Whatever you do, by the end of the process, you're going to have a rich, interconnected network of memory palaces, multiple images that you can use in those palaces and be able to navigate them easily and populate them with all kinds of glorious mental Lego. It doesn't matter whether it's historical facts, chemical equations, or keyboard shortcuts. Just remember that the key to making all of this work is the combination of study and practice. Start with a small amount of information in just one memory palace, but make sure you have multiple memory palaces building up over time so that you're constantly expanding your spatial memory, which is going to expand your autobiographical memory, your episodic memory, your figural memory. Oh my goodness, all the memories that you have. There's level after level after level. I'm pretty sure that the scientists are just waiting to announce another level that they found. Exercise them all and find yourself navigating through your memory palaces as easily as you walk through your own home. And keep beginner's mind 
on a constant loop as you study and practice. You'll be amazed by how many other things beside your memory really start to shine. You know, the thing with memory is that if you don't use it, that bowl of memory, if we can use that metaphor, it will start to collect dust. And so you got to shine it up again. But the dust will never collect if you just keep shining and shining and shining. You know, there's good scientific research and reports from people throughout history that serious dedication to these techniques is life improving with no particular end to the upward spiral of personal fulfillment and joy that goes beyond the worldly matters of passing exams. It's pretty cool to pass exams, don't get me wrong. I got a PhD, I got an MA, I got another MA, I got a BA. At various times in my life, I had to get a license to serve alcohol. I got that test passed, no problem. I had to have a security guard license at a different time. Oh my goodness. I sometimes do magic tricks and I got to re-memorize a deck in order to do mem deck work, which is ooh, the ne plus ultra of magic. That's another kind of exam. Boom. It's all practical. Practical down the line. But at the end of the day, there's something more, which is beyond words. It's ineffable, but it is a connection with you and your mind. So better memory for better living is available for you anytime you're ready to start and just keep going. Polish the bowl of your memory. Polish, polish, polish. And the Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass is there to help you out, as am I, with my endless passion for teaching these techniques. Now, let's address some of the common pitfalls you might encounter. I've been addressing some of them all along, but we'll have a dedicated section on how to overcome them. As you start implementing the advanced memory palace technique of having multiple memory palaces, you might encounter some challenges like, mm, let's see, confusion between locations. The pitfall here is that you're mixing up information from different palaces, and the solution is to ensure that your locations are visually distinct and that every single one of them is optimized for recall rehearsal. Use recall rehearsal so you never are in this, hold on a second, I must go to my mind palace stuff. No, use strong, unique transitions between the memory palaces, each memory palace being unique. Right? And practice moving between these locations regularly, which you will do anyway when you use recall rehearsal. Now, avoid overcrowding. The pitfall here is you're just trying to fit too much information into one memory palace. So the solution is multiple memory palaces. I know, big surprise, right? But don't hesitate to create new locations or sub-locations. There are principles for that that you can learn like the hierarchical approach that we just touched upon, where we have primary ideas in primary locations, sub-ideas in sub-locations, etc., and you can pillar them out, so to speak. Whatever you do, you're going to regularly review, and if you need to, you can sometimes reorganize your palaces. However, here's the pitfall there. If you have to do that, you probably aren't using the magnetic memory method, because the magnetic memory method optimizes for getting it right the first time, at least most of the time. Mistakes will happen, but those mistakes will be your teacher. Because remember, Magnetic Memory Method is about you using methods to develop your own systems. And they need to be your own. The memory science makes it clear. Personalization is the key. You do not have to take my word for it. So get deeply involved. I've been trying to get you deeply involved today. Did you complete those exercises? If not, do it. Because that's going to help in each and every way. Now, another pitfall that people have is they may have fading memories, difficulty recalling details over time. This is going to happen in some cases, especially if you do long form things like me. But sometimes you're not really forgetting. Sometimes you're just thinking about so many different things at the same time, you're going to get the ugly sister effect. It happened recently with Luke Ranieri when he was talking about his Iliad 100 project, and I was trying to get Tertva, Muharnavam, Hatva, Regadvesh, Dirakshashan, Yoga, Shanta, Senta, Yuktatma, Ramo, Varajate, out of my mouth, and Tertva and Hatva were just like, they were gone. But they weren't really gone. It's just other stuff was coming. I was trying to say so many things. So, in that case, you know, it's just a little bit about relaxation and also just letting it go. 
But one thing that can help, and I told him when that happened, he's like, well, it's been a while since I actually got that out of my mouth. Because sometimes I recite my Sanskrit just silently. I have mouth problems, and if I use my lips too much, I get this angular chylitis, and it hurts so bad and so forth. But that is what it is. And I saved my mouth for these videos for you as much as I can. But at the end of the day, the thing is, is that it has a negative effect insofar as the ego may get bruised if the words don't come out of my mouth as fluidly, as dexterously as I would like. And this is my situation. You may not have that problem, but you probably will have the problem if you don't regularly speak what it is you want to memorize, especially if it's challenging things in other languages. right? And you'll fall flat on your face. I've fallen flat on my face a few times, <laughs> more than a few. But who cares? I mean, if you're going to let your ego rule the roost, good luck. Get rid of that ego. Good riddance. And using memory itself can help you get rid of your ego. Even faster if you memorize some of the Sanskrit that I've memorized. It doesn't even have to be the Sanskrit. It could be Tao Te Ching or something like that. Uh, Dao Ke Dao, Fei Chong Dao, Ming Ku Ming, Fei Chong Ming. Woohoo! It feels so good, right? Whatever it is. Schedule regular review sessions. Because when you do that, it's going to make it easier to get it out of your mouth. And if you have to use your mouth to speak it, make sure in your review that you're using your mouth to speak it. And if things fade and you make mistakes, just own it. You're not helping yourself or anybody else by getting bruised, okay? Get down, get hurt, learn how to get back up again, and use spaced repetition techniques. Spaced repetition is the scientific word for what I prefer to call recall rehearsal. And recall rehearsal is quite highly optimized based on the patterns that Herman Ebbinghaus discovered. And uh, if you submit yourself to that discipline, not only will you have many, many fewer mistakes, but when you do have mistakes, mm, ABC, always be cool. It'll just happen to you automatically. Now, you also want to work on making your memory images more vivid and outrageous when you need to. Now, the outrageous point is something that some people get blocked on, and they don't want wild and weird images in their minds. I get this to a certain extent, but I've noticed something paradoxical. Often when people say that they don't want their minds filled with weird and wonderful, exaggerated, extreme mnemonic images, they're memorizing information that has extreme imagery in it. So the Bible, for example, has God flooding the world. I mean, how much more violent and extreme do you get? You know, I don't want to be blasphemous here. Forgive me, Father, I know not what I do. But at the end of the day, you know, if I want to be honest with you, in principio erat verbum, okay, in the beginning was the word. Cool. John 1 in Latin. The God that I'm interested in would be the one who says, hey man, get that stuff memorized because I flooded the world and I have such a bad memory, I have to put a rainbow in the sky to remember not to do that again, right? So if God needs memory techniques that are linked to violence, we might need them too. So <laughs> you be you, but I solved this riddle for myself a long time ago. You may want to visit a psychotherapist or other sort of therapist to deal with this because there is a thing called harm OCD and some people have it and you, you could probably get more comfortable with having weird and bizarre images in your mind. I mean, a lot of the trouble that the world is in right now is coming from the fact that people see things that are outside of their control because the internet is so addictive. So really the argument that I have to propose to you is don't struggle with having wild and weird images shown to you all the time learn to relax into it because it's probably just going to get more and more crazy and extreme going forward. But don't ever diminish that possible negative impact. Be healthy about it. Get help if you need it. And at the end of the day, as you refine your practice, you'll be able to work on more and more subtle levels. And you can access some of them now in the Magnetic Mary Method Masterclass. There are eight magnetic modes. Those are the main ones. Kinesthetic, auditory, visual, emotional, conceptual, olfactory, gustatory, and spatial. I use them most of the time. But there are 20 more that get more and more subtle. And as you improve in your practice, you'll be able to use those subtleties much, much better. And then you won't have extreme images in many cases at all. But quite frankly, for myself, when I need them, 
I use them, okay? So this is a pitfall, it is a real issue, it is an area, but I encourage you to work with memory techniques in such a way that you transcend, my friend, because you never know when you're gonna wanna memorize, I don't know, the first 100 lines of the Iliad, you know, of Peleus, son Achilles. Sing, O muse, the vengeance, deep and deadly, whence to Greece, unnumbered ills arose. So, <laughs> since it's such a beautiful line for all its ugliness, why wouldn't we? Why, why, why wouldn't we just do what it takes to get it memorized, given the fact that the content itself is extreme? All right. The next pitfall that people have is struggles with navigation, getting lost within individual memory palaces, but then getting lost inside of the network itself. Well, the solution is to keep a journal. Keep a memory palace journal. Overview your entire system in drawings, in writing. Now, sometimes people say, well, I can't draw. And I say, please, 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 please. I'm using the word draw in a very simple sense. It is dragging an implement over a page. You can call it sketches. My memory palaces are chicken scratches at best. So please don't overthink this. I'm just going to keep on using the word draw because it literally means to draw something across a page, to drag it, right? But if you just get consistent about drawing your memory palaces, actually looking at them sometimes when you're memorizing to reduce cognitive load, you're going to be better and better and better. Look, I've been doing this for years, and some days I have a bad day. The rain is coming down, it's dark and cloudy, whatever, I'm not in the mood, and I just, to keep myself going, I have the memory palaces visually around me all the time, and I pick it up and I look at it and I keep going, keep going, keep going. Put some grit into your life and make it easier. And the grit doesn't have to be all that tough to chew. You can have things that assist you to keep going and going and keep practicing navigation across multiple memory palaces. And you know, another thing you can do, this is an idea that I think I got from Mark Shannon, is practice speed runs through your locations, but also slow runs. And wow, you know, that's just a cool idea, going as fast as you can through memory palace, but then also go as slow as you can through memory palace. Often we're all just in too much of a hurry. You know, take your time, learn this technique. Think of the Karate Kid and Mr. Miyagi. Wax on, wax off, wax on, wax off. The Karate Kid doesn't get to understand why, why he's doing all that stuff. <laughs> later, he figures it out. When I say these things, don't worry, it'll all make sense later. Now, another pitfall is the idea of interference. New information interfering with previous information, right? This is the ugly sister effect. Well, the solutions are, you know, using distinct areas, for temporary location versus long-term locations. You can regularly clean your memory palaces, removing, you know, stuff that you did before. I don't do that anymore because I found that, wait a second, this is the miracle of memory that I remember all this stuff, right? But you can, you can clear out memory palaces. I used to use Mickey Mouse in Fantasia with all those brooms that come to life and they would clean out the memory palaces, but I just stopped doing it. If I really need a memory palace to be cleared out, I'll just leave it fallow which is to say, I just won't use it for a year or two or months or what have you. But I think all of this is just a problem that comes from people who don't have enough memory palaces. If you have enough memory palaces, you'll be able to just reuse memory palaces over and over and over again, compound them, etc. But as you're beginning to learn this, create clear boundaries between different subjects, different time periods that you're committing to memory if you're dealing with history, and have distinction between the memory palaces. A beach is different than a street have that distinction. Now, another pitfall is lack of flexibility. Many people are just super inflexible. If I don't know every single detail right now, and if I don't have success in the next five minutes, I'm out of here. Toodaloo. I mean, that's not the attitude that you're going to find success with. The solution is relax, chill out, man. This is like a mental martial art of the mind. And some people respond to authority really well. I'm more of a passive, submissive teacher, probably because I memorize all of this Sanskrit and the Tao Te Ching in Mandarin and blah, 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 blah. Like I'm just, yeah, let's just relax. But you may find that you need a coach who's just like, shut up and give me 20 because some people respond that way. But whatever you do, do not have unrealistic expectations of something that people work on 
you know? Oh, I want to fly a fighter jet in 10 minutes. No, you don't. I mean, you do, but you're not going to. You're going to have to go through the qualifications. Assuming you pass the qualifications, you're going to have to learn the math. Assuming you learn the math, you're going to have to follow the checklist. And ain't nobody going to say, yeah, you're the exception to the rule. No checklist for you because you're obviously an ace fighter pilot. No, 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 no. You're an ace fighter pilot precisely because you check off all the boxes, right? So <laughs> all of which is to say, get out of your head, get out of your ego, put it aside. And if you need to use these techniques to help you put it aside, because I had to do that. And then practice just imagining, reimagining, restructuring memory palaces. Think about using modular designs that can be super easy to expand if you need to, and just get into the whole enchilada. Now, that's going to lead to another pitfall, which is people feeling intimidated or overwhelmed by all these ideas. Man, this guy's saying so many things. Can't you just spoon feed it to me? Well, I, I can spoon feed it to you. I mean, I made Flyboy the Memory Detective novel. I'm making the Memory Detective Junior series. I've made the Memory Detective game to make it as simple as possible. I've made all kinds of really, really simple things. The reality is, though, is you can just make it simple for yourself. Get your first network together and then start with just one location and gradually expand from there. I don't think that there is such a thing as levels or, you know, we're going to have some special words like, okay, you've made your first Mary Palace. Here's your badge. Ding, 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 ding. This kind of gamification, quite frankly, if I can just be straight up with you, that's so, that's such a denigration of the art of memory. The art of memory is for people who want to master something. You study and you practice and you have the best possible expectation of success because you recognize reality. That's why I call my book Smarter, serious, mature, and ready to embrace reality, right? And if you aren't there yet, get smarter, read it, follow the steps in it, master memory palaces, and don't get lost in this learned helplessness of, oh, I got to look at Instagram all day and I wonder why that my mind is so weak. No, this is a skill that when you invest in it and when you study it and when you practice it, it will strengthen your mind. Now, it is the case that everyone's mind works a little bit differently. It has to, right? Because your mind is yours and my mind is mine. But don't be discouraged if you encounter any of these challenges. Don't waste a moment comparing yourself to anyone else. The key is to be persistent and patient with yourself where you are right now. There is no one size fits all art of memory. There is no cookie cutter design that you can just snap up and plug into your mind like Johnny Mnemonic and then, you know, like Neo go, oh, I know Kung Fu. No, and Neo doesn't know Kung Fu either, by the way. What does Morpheus do in the Matrix? He says, show me. Then he takes him to the dojo. And then after that, what happens? Well, he, Morpheus gives Neo another test. And then what happens after that? Well, Morpheus gives Neo another test and then another one and another one and then they got a sequel with a bunch more tests and then they got another sequel and then you know uh, the, their cash bags are dr running dry so they made a part four and on and on and on i mean the whole point is is that the tests never end seek out more tests the better you get the more you're going to find powerful exercises that challenge you to go to the next level and the next level and the next now with that in mind in the Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass, I have practiced myself as a student of my own ideas, my own requirements. And I want to share some personal insights with you on that basis. The techniques that we've discussed today, using multiple locations, linking them together, organizing the information across various memory palaces, these are concepts I've experimented with extensively, and I still use the core of these ideas in the most refined manner possible. Teleportation tactics are powerful tools that many experts and mnemonic athletes have explored and used to various degrees. However, as I've continued to refine my approach to memory enhancement, I've found that these methods, while effective, can sometimes be more complex than they're worth. They can help you confuse activity with accomplishment. 
And this is part of the realization that led me to develop the magnetic memory method as it is and how it works. Spatial memory, visualization, organization, all streamlines into a much more accessible, everyday approach that reduces the cognitive overhead of managing multiple, complex, mental landscapes when you at least know about my memory-based approach and why it works as it does. On top of its simplicity, I suggest that you focus on implementing the exercises so you can start to encode faster and ultimately memorize on the fly when you want to or need to. And focus on scalability above all because large amounts of information can be handled without teleporting all over the place. That's where recall rehearsal comes in. This is the key. So whatever you do, optimize your memory palaces for that. It is so important, especially if you're a student like I once was, and I couldn't afford to retake exams. You want to maximize your free time like I did by running a small press on the side while I was doing my PhD, by getting a second MA while I was doing my PhD? You can do that with minimal effort. So I thank you for being here, for being subscribed, for hitting that thumbs up. I mean, literally smashing it. That helps this project out in so many ways. And I highly recommend you learn what recall rehearsal is, how it works, by watching my video on the Memory Palace technique for studying next. Even if you're not a university student, or even if you have no exams on the horizon, maybe you're a grandparent who can share this with your grandkids. Remember, the world of memory techniques is vast, and what works best can vary from person to person, but those variations between us are usually pretty minimal due to the presence of, you know, the human brain. No matter what's going on in my noggin, I always encourage you to experiment with different methods. I do myself, gathering as many Memory Palace books as I can, or just memory technique books, and adding them on. Doing real experiments, though. Metivier's razor says very clearly that to give up on any technique before 90 days has passed does not deserve the phrase, I tried. Give this time and go through everything we talked about today twice. Do the exercises if you haven't and find in those exercises the memory palaces that resonate with you and what you need to do. And as you keep experimenting, keep that memory journal. It'll not only help you gather all your memory palaces in one spot, but it'll help you see ways to adapt and modify memory techniques that I can't even anticipate. I've been at this for so long, but never have I stopped being surprised by people emailing me and saying, wow, have you ever heard about this? And it's true. After all these years, I still get people suggesting things that I never thought of. The well of memory is bottomless and you can explore it without end. Next time, we're gonna explore even more interesting ways to use memory palaces in simple ways, in advanced ways, in ways that will help you set the stage for aging well with your memory, because even if you're only 28 or even a little bit younger than that, memory loss is already starting. So we have a lot to cover on this channel. Applications like language learning, which I've already covered a lot, but we're gonna do more. How do I remember different things, like words about the occipital lobe and the parietal lobe and, I don't know, the, the scaphoid bone, which could also be called the navicular? That's scientific study, basically. We'll cover that. We'll talk about professional development, getting jobs, getting raises. So, get inspired. This is about feeling excited and alive, which comes alive only when you loop study and practice, study and practice, putting it in paper, in a journal. Your mental landscapes are going to become so magnetic. Go ahead, watch the Memory Palace technique for studying next. And as always, keep yourself magnetic.